What's going on, Center Stage? This is B Mac with another great interview lined up for all you metal freaks out there. I'm talking to a guy that's from Sweden who dresses for success but plays ferociously on stage. He's the co founder and guitarist for the group out in Sweden, Amaranthi, and it's a great pleasure to talk to him today. So please help me welcome the always talented Olaf Mark. Hey, Olaf. Hi there, thank you very much for that great introduction. <laughs> Always dresses for success, but rocks on the stage. Well, yeah, That's cool, I mean, man. I mean, you see, <laughs> it's you a pleasure see the, to be here. Well, I mean, you see those music videos, and most of the time you're in a suit, you're playing the violin. I mean, you look like a successful businessman who could shred a guitar at the same time. Well, as I always say, there is no reason why we cannot be civilized, right? Absolutely. <laughs> So, hey, first off, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Amaranthi? Like, how did it get started? For those of you, for those of the fans who don't know who you guys are yet. Sure. Uh, I mean, it was a pretty relaxed thing that me and Jake E was doing back in 2008. Just, you know, hanging out as friends, composing a few songs. And um, we had Elise and Andy, the other two singers, just trying, you know, to, to see, see what, what they, they could come up with, with you know, with singing on the songs. And, we, we kind, kind of figured, figured that it, it, was it was something really different, different from anything, anything else that was going on back then, and it was like really modern and, and everything. So uh, I think already with the response that we had on MySpace back then, it made us sort of realize that, okay, it's not only us that are into this stuff, so let's try to do something with it. And we played a couple of shows, we um, talked with a lot of different record labels, and uh, the result of that was the um, first album coming out in 2011, and uh, we've been on the road ever since pretty much. Yeah, what an inspirational record that was. I mean, really great songs. I mean, if anything, I categorize your music as melodic death metal with a pop twist. How do you feel about yeah. that? Label? Sure, that's that's um, very accurate. I would say. Well, yeah. What made you want to pick up a guitar and play music? What was the one point in your life where you said, "I have to do this"? Well, I was growing up with a lot of rock and metal music through my father, and I think. Um, but the real defining moment was probably discovering Metallica somewhere, you know, in the late '80s, <clears throat> and I was just completely blown away with that. I was, I didn't know you could sound like that or, you know, play such aggressive things on on the guitar. I played a little bit of piano and, you know, a little bit of violin and stuff like that. But when I heard those those guys, you know, playing their loud shows and shredding their guitars and everything, I just realized that, shit, this is really something that I I want to pick up and I want to learn. And of course, when I finally started to play the guitar, then I discovered Ingrid Malmsteen and Steve I and all these, you know, guitar giants. So the more I discovered, the more inspired I got, and the more I practiced, the more into it I got. Oh yeah, and you can definitely tell the Ingve Malmsteen influence in there. I mean, it's very, very, it's very uh, symphonic, and uh, if I said that correctly, and it just got that classical taste in there, guitar playing. Yeah, it's, it's definitely there. I mean, it's, it's partly there from listening to a lot of neoclassical metal, like, you know, Symphony X and um, Amy Malmsteen and stuff like that. But it, is, it also comes from, you know, playing a lot of classical music on the violin and, um, and the piano and so forth. And it's, it's not a whole lot of, you know, classical influences in Amaranth's music, but you can definitely hear the uh, sort of, as you say, the Amy Malmsteen or neoclassical vibe in the, in the solo guitar playing, for sure. Oh, yes. Yeah. What, what's really cool about uh, Amaranthi was is the is the inclusion of three singers in there. You got the guy who does the poppy, uh, the boy band voice, if you were, the the woman who sounds like an angel, and you got the growler up there. And originally it was Henrik. Uh, what impressed you about Henrik to bring him on board to the band? Well, me and Jake met at Henrik in 2012, I think, when we were playing at like this award show in in Stockholm. And we just figured at first that he was a really cool guy, and um, he became a good friend. And then I heard his band called Scarpoint, and I was just realizing that he it was one of the better growlers that I've heard from our country in a really long time. So when Andy was starting to think about, you know, focusing on his family and stepping down, then Henrik was the the first choice, choice and the obvious choice, and also the obvi uh, on top of that the final choice. So it, it was never really a whole lot of thinking. We just asked Henrik, and he was really into it. So then he became a part of the band. Yeah, and then uh, like uh, three years ago, he unfortunately departed the band to uh, pursue his own uh, desires. Um, do you, is there any um, that? And that was an amicable split, right? 
Uh, yes, yes, entirely, a hundred percent. I mean, we we always really got along well as you know friends and everything. And I I played shows with Andy, you know, in um, in different bands ever since I was like fourteen or fifteen. So, but I I, I guess uh, some of us had different goals, you know, when when we started the band and when joining the band in the first place because we had a great vision that it could be something something real and something big and like a touring unit. And I think that Andy was always a little bit surprised that it got uh, pretty big pretty fast. And he wasn't really in, into becoming a full-time musician. And I mean, it's a different kind of life and it's it's definitely not for everybody. And I guess it, it wasn't really for him. So it was good that he realized that in time <laughs> before burning himself out. Yeah, well, he was a good voice, especially on the Nexus, because that was the first song. I'll tell you the story of how, really quick of how I uh, found you guys. I was on YouTube one time. I was just trying to find some really cool new metal music. All of a sudden, I come across the video for the Nexus. I thought, oh, what do I got to lose? So I, I turn it on, and I was so impressed with the sound, the vocal work, the guitars, everything. I mean, you guys were, like, incredible. Cool. Thanks, man. Oh, no problem. And, um... You got a new album coming out this October, Maximalism. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. Absolutely. I mean, it's um, it's one of the first interviews that we're doing for. I mean, since finishing the album, just like a week ago. So it's extremely, extremely exciting. It's still, you know, for us, we've been out touring with the Massive Addictive and the Nexus uh, records and the first one for such a long time. We played the songs a million times, and now we have something new finally to perform, and it's. It's it's certainly a different album. I would say that you know, with the Massive Addictive record, it was a, a noticeable change from what we were doing on the Nexus. And I would say that in some ways, the change is even bigger on this album. It's just that, I guess it's gotten more diverse. So we have a bunch of really classic Amaran songs. We have some songs that are a lot heavier, and then you have some songs that are way more into the the pop kind of thing. So the whole thing has gotten a little bit less streamlined and more adventurous, I guess. So, you're exploring, so, it's, uh, so you could say you're exploring different different uh, sides of uh, rock and roll that would appease to the fans. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Well, what we were trying not to do was just to have a formula that we could be repeating for forever, because I think a lot of bands do that, that become you know slightly successful or whatever. They just take whatever worked and they just repeat it and just hope that fans will continue to listen to it. And of course, a lot of fans, some fans can appreciate when a band is really predictable, but I think a band like Amaran sort of gained a lot of attention because we were doing something new and something fresh. And doing four albums that sounds almost exactly the same would have lost that you know, freshness to it. So, and, and basically, what we're trying to do, uh, in all honesty, is not to think too much about it either, and not to plan it too much. But you, you know, really follow your heart and what, what is the kind of music that you want to do, what you want to play, and um, I mean, what is it that you're interested in showing with your musicality and your songwriting? So, so it's been an extremely exciting record to um, to write and to record, and it's by far the album that we worked the hardest and the most on. So it's going to be really interesting to see what people think about it. Well, I can certainly wait to hear it, and I'm sure the fans will too. Um, can you tell us like a uh... What are the, what do you think are going to be the standout tracks that fans are really going to respond to? Can you give me a couple? Absolutely. There is, um, for example, there is a song that is certainly the most different one on the album. It's going to create a lot of opinions, and I think that a lot of people will like it, but it should also be quite controversial. And it's a song that is simply titled That Song. So it's a pretty fitting title. When people are discussing it, they can always refer to that song by Amaranth. And we also have some really, really killer tracks that are even more, you know, have even even stronger earworms and stronger hooks than ever. A song like Boomerang, for example, is going to be something that people will be humming for a long time, hopefully. And also, I'm really particular to the um, opening track called Maximize. And it really sort of sets the... Um, it sets the bar and sets the sound for the rest of the album, and it's maybe it's a little bit more of a traditional Amaranth track. So when you start the album from the beginning, then you sort of lulled into something that is 
slightly familiar but still fresh and then it just sort of takes off from there so those are the three are certainly standard tracks i also have to mention a song um like the main ballad of the album called endlessly and it's really a huge hollywood epic sort of end credits ballad and definitely the, the most ambitious thing we've done in terms of arrangements with the real strings and that whole thing so yes it's going to be really interesting to, to see people's reactions to it yeah, your songs are uh, just out of this world. You do different kinds of styles with your songs, from the Nexus to Invincible to True to um, the the, the title of your uh, uh, Armoranth. That one was beautiful. Uh, what, what what draws your inspiration from these songs? Like from personal experience, or just some philosophical meaning, or just to write music? What is it? I mean, in terms of lyrics and, I guess, songwriting as well, I mean, it's not something, when it comes to influences, it can be specific events, it can be specific, uh, you know, periods in your life or, you know, things like that. But usually, it's something that flows kind of organically. I mean, it has happened that you have this, okay, I'm going to write a song about this specific event. And true is really something that was, for example, self-experienced and self-lived. And, um, and just to cross-reference that to the new album, the song that is called <laughs> That Song, is really about, you know, the struggle of, of being a musician and trying to make it and trying to survive and then, you know, finally have some form of rec recognition and what that means for, for your passion and for your life and, you know, the good things and the bad things that come with it. So, um, I guess it is a pretty wide range of things. Once again, on the new album, it's, it's going to be everything from pure party songs. Because um, even if some metal musicians might sneer towards something that is party or entertainment or anything like that, I think that there's already 99 million metal bands that write about death and suicide and, you know, whatever that could be. And I think it can be really important to have some positive energy flowing as well in, in the music. And I think that's sort of where Amaranth fits in a little bit lyrically. And then it can be, you know, anything from heartbreak in the song Endlessly, for example, to uh, something that's maybe a little bit on the same theme as Invincible, uh, this Boomerang song. It might sound like a light <laughs> title somehow, but it's really about, you know, always coming back. Even if everything pushes you down, even if people are trying to hold you down, then you always come back like a boomerang. <laughs> That's awesome. And I agree with you with uh, having a positive message in songs because recently I did an interview with uh, Gemini Syndrome frontman Aaron Nordstrom and he said uh, that while the new album, uh, Memento Mori, has some dark overtones, and it does have like positive messages about life and uh, live it to the fullest. And we need more of those kind of music. I mean, you know, we need more positive messages in metal. I mean, it, sometimes I feel like it gets a bad name, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think uh, without getting too deep into it, I think there was um, there were some good things happening in that regard in the 80s and the early 90s, but then it just got too commercialized, you know, with all the hair metal bands and, and stuff like that. And of course, the reaction towards that was, you know, first the grunge and then the new metal, and everything was sort of dark in tone because to win credibility, you sort of needed to prove that you were not one of those commercial hair metal bands. But Commerciality and hair metal bands aside, there, there can always be room for, you know, singing about good experiences and th singing about, you know, becoming stronger and lifting yourself up or, you know, going through hard times and coming out as a better person. It doesn't only have to be about, you know, how dark things can get. So I, I, I think, just like you're saying, it's really important with the positive message as well in metal music. Yes, it does. And Back to the, the three singer uh, uh, chemistry that you have in this group. You use Elise Rod, who I'm actually going to be speaking to in a few minutes. Um, yes. What, what, drew her, what drew you guys to her voice and say, hey, we got to have you in this band? What made you want to have her come on board? Well, I have to say it like this. Quite honestly, it wasn't really, you know, that we were looking for a female singer and then she auditioned or anything like that. I think it's important to underline that. You know, Elise was such an early part of the band that she, she can very easily be considered, you know, a co-founding member somehow. Because um, she was a very good friend to both me and Jake. And I knew since before 
because she was singing on one of my other bands' uh, records, uh, a Dragonland album. And you knew that she was just the most phenomenal singer I've heard in just ages and ages. And um, it turns out I helped her to apply for the vacant position of uh, in Nightwish. After Tari, I got, um, got fired or quit. And then I just realized even deeper how, how good she was. So when she was hanging out at um, uh, Jane's place, we were just, okay, so you should try to sing a little bit on this just as a guest. But then, like I said earlier in the interview, when we heard the songs with her voice on it, we were just like, okay, this is just killer. Her voice fits perfectly into the whole metal thing. Even if it's really poppy and very different, then it just makes everything a lot more interesting and very musical. So I, I think that she really felt the same. She was probably, she probably didn't know really what she was getting into at that time, you know, with the full-time band and that whole thing. But then again, I don't think that anybody of us really did. And I think that she's always been, you know, a very, very vital and very central creative driving force and spirit of the band in general. So she gets a lot of credit for being a great singer, but she should also get an equal amount of credit for being a fantastic songwriter, a great co-composer as well. Oh, I so yes, she's a wonderful, wonderful person and a great asset. Well, I'm sure she's a great songwriter, and I can't wait to talk to her in a few minutes, because uh, I'll admit, she was kind of one of the reasons that drew me to your group. That voice just caught my eye, caught my ears. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, she is, uh, she is a great um, performer on stage as well, because she brings something, once again, to the metal scene that people are not used to. And she has a much more open and entertaining and charismatic stage presence than, you know, uh, most typical, you know, singers in female front of bands or, you know, things like that. So, yeah, she's, she's a wonderful asset in, in many ways. And like I said, she's also a really great friend. Well, that is so true. And when I when I saw the Nexus music video, uh, I was kind of blown away. Uh, what was the meaning behind the music video? You guys are in a, you guys were frozen in a, some kind of a capsule that, you know, this cryogenically suspends your bodies. You, you and your band come back, and you're in this futuristic world, and you got these assassins hunting you. Uh, what, what was the whole point behind the Nexus music video? I think, you know, <laughs> you described it like, like the storyline pretty accurately, and the way that it fits into the story, um, because there is sort of a concept or a story running through the first two, um, two albums. And... Um, I mean, it, it's not meant to be like a super obvious story, but it certainly has these, you know, we, we pretty much wrote a story so it could inspire us to write this, the right kind of, you know, futuristic and um, almost a bit dystopian, but at the same time uplifting you know, lyrics and so on. So I think um, the way that it fits in, you sort of need to be aware of the whole story and it might be a little bit tricky, but um, maybe we should do a full story into you sometime in the future. <laughs> oh, we'll be, be dead or something like that. Cool, cool. man. <laughs> All right, we got time for a uh, for a couple more questions here. Um, you guys yes. uh, just finished up some festivals, and and I know you and the guys are uh, taking a vacation, taking a breather, and I really appreciate you talking to me on your vacation time. That means a lot to me. Oh, um, it's no problem at all. What is the one festival that you hope to play for play at? in the future, like in the upcoming year of touring? Hmm, that's interesting because uh, we've had, the, you know, the, the huge pressure of, um, of playing like pretty much all the biggest festivals in, in Europe, at least, uh, throughout the last year. So then this year we got to perform at Grass Pop and Sweden Rock Festival and, uh, you know, Masses of Rock. All of them, you know, 20, 30,000 people plus. So that's been really, really exciting. but. Uh, and in terms of Europe, of course, the king of all the metal festivals is uh, Rock and Open Air in Germany. So, uh, I mean, it's not at all impossible that we play there next year. So that will be, you know, a huge high point. And then also, we never played, like, any of the real festivals in, um, in the United States and in North America. So everything from, I don't know, Rocklahoma to, uh, you know, Heavy Montreal or, you know, festivals like that would be really, really cool to be part of. So I really hope that we have, the, you know, the opportunity to do that because we'll certainly play a lot in America once again in support of this album. Well, that would be cool, man. And I hope you guys come to Anaheim because that's where I live and I've been wanting to see you guys ever since I discovered you. 
Oh yeah, I mean we will certainly always come back to California. It's usually always always great audience and great atmosphere and the weather is really nice for a Swedish person as well. So yeah, hope to see you there in Anaheim. Man. Oh, I think you will. And speaking of festivals, I can actually see you guys hopefully headline next year. Download. Would you want to play oh, download? Yeah. Definitely, it's it, that's a really really good point because we never played that download. I think it was we were scheduled to play though way really back in eleven or twelve or something like that, but for for several different reasons it didn't happen. And uh, it would certainly make a lot of sense since um, the UK is not part of the European tour as well. So yeah, we would love to do that, and uh, we'll, we'll be crossing our fingers uh, that we can do that next year. Hey, you know what? If they gave a spot to Baby Metal this year, I'm sure they'll give you a spot next year. There you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, and my last question I'm going to ask is uh, one that I always ask my guests, and it really tells me what kind of songwriter they truly are. You ready for this one? Absolutely. All right. Beatles or Rolling Stones? Rolling Stones. Ooh. A lot of, guys, mm-hmm. a lot of, a lot of uh, guests always go for the Beatles. Why the Rolling Stones? Well, I'm... There's a lot of interesting things about the, the, the Beatles, but I think I'm just more biased, actually, to, to be honest, towards Rolling Stones, because that's pretty much what I grew up with. Once again, my father was playing a lot of Rolling Stones, and I always really liked, you know, the groove and the, the drive and, the, of course, the simplicity that you have in, um, in Rolling Stones' music. But when, when, in terms of Beatles, of course, um, uh, Lennon and McCartney were and are... Uh, Great songwriters. I mean, Paul McCartney still is. And um, there's a lot of things, interesting things going on, you know, in terms of a harmony and stuff like that. But I think that, you know, in my opinion, of course, Beatles have a billion number one hit singles. But to me, personally, I think that Rolling Stones stand out a little bit more as, you know, hit songwriters, in my mind, at least. Oh, that's awesome, man. Well, hey, Olaf, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me and with Center Stage Magazine. You are a great musician all around. Thank you very much, Brian, and thank yeah. you for the compliments, and thank you for the great questions, and, um, and I hope to see you soon in yeah. California. And, and Center Stage Magazine, don't forget to pick up Amarant's new album coming out this October, Maximalism. If you love Swedish melodic death metal with a pop twist, as I mentioned, this group's the group for you. And be sure to look for them on their website at amaranthi.com for upcoming tour dates in the U.S. and Europe. So, Olaf, again, thank you very much, and I will see you when you come back to Southern California. Maybe we'll get a drink. Definitely. Definitely, Brandon. Thank you so much once again, and uh, see you soon, Ray. All right, and have a